All small towns have their horror stories, tales of places plagued by terrifying apparitions, unseen forces, and something waiting in the shadows to terrorize unsuspecting innocents. Sometimes it's a bridge at the edge of town, where a man in a bunny suit stalks, wielding an axe and looking for drivers who wander off of the main road. Sometimes it's a cabin in the woods rumored to house an old gnarled witch who steals people away and throws them into a giant soup pot. Maybe it's a cursed hotel where wicked spirits roam the halls and the guests check in but never check out. Or maybe, like the little town where 16-year-old Mark lived, it's a haunted house. Ever since he was a little boy, Mark had been terrified of the house at the end of the lane. He walked past it on his way to school each morning and on his way back in the late afternoon. The sight of it made his palms sweat, his heart beat just a little bit faster. It had once been a grand Victorian manor, with turrets and a wraparound porch painted a brilliant white. But over the years, the paint had faded to a dingy yellow, peeling away from the rotting wood. There were holes in the roof where the rain and snow dripped through between the shingles. The windows were caked with dust and grime, obscuring anything that might be hiding inside. Not that there should have been anything there. The house had been abandoned for decades. Still, whenever he passed it, Mark could swear he felt the presence of something in there, pacing, watching, waiting for him to come inside. The stories around town didn't help. His parents told him to ignore them, said that people just liked to talk when there was nothing else to do, to make up things to be afraid of because their lives were too boring otherwise. But he couldn't avoid it. On a Boy Scouts trip when he was 12, Mark had tried to cover his ears when the other boys gathered around the campfire with him and turned the topic to the old house, but they teased and taunted him until he listened. They leaned in, faces lit ghoulishly from below by the flickering orange flames, and whispered about the ghost that had taken up residence inside the house. A wealthy old woman had lived there a long, long time ago, they said. She was cruel, with a nasty temper. Everyone in town knew to avoid her, knowing she would throw things at them from her window, shout at them, even sick her guard dogs on them. But one group of boys in town couldn't resist giving her a good scare. They dressed up in all black, red devil masks covering their faces, and broke into her house late one night. When she awoke, they were standing at the foot of her bed, holding pitchforks and telling her that they had come to drag her to hell. Her heart stopped from pure terror at the sight, but her spirit lingered in the house, swearing revenge against anyone who ever dared cross her threshold again, especially teenage boys. Mark didn't sleep a wink the whole camping trip after hearing that. He swore then and there that no matter what, he would never go into that house. But everyone can be bought and everyone has a price. For Mark, that price was a car. He had been saving up as best he could, but it was tough to get a job with no way to transport himself there, and mowing lawns for his neighbors wasn't the most lucrative gig. So when he learned that his neighbor Oliver, home on a break from college, was getting rid of his old car, he begged to buy it. He doubted Oliver would go for it, knowing what a jerk the guy could be. But to Mark's surprise, Oliver gave him an offer. I'll tell you what. Oliver's face broke into a sadistic smile. I'll give you the car, if you can spend the whole night in the house at the end of the street, alone. Are you serious? Mark scoffed. Dead serious. Make it to sunrise without freaking out and bailing and the car's yours. We have a deal? Oliver stuck out his hand to shake. Every nerve in Mark's body was screaming at him to say no, but if he didn't agree, he wouldn't be able to afford a car until he was in college. With a defeated sigh, he took Oliver's hand. Deal. But as night fell and Mark prepared to meet Oliver outside of the derelict old house, he could feel pangs of regret deep in his stomach. What was he thinking? Was a car really worth living his worst nightmare? What if Oliver didn't honor the deal? Or worse, what if the stories were actually true? He swallowed the lump in his throat as he shoved a sandwich into his backpack. He had food, water, a blanket, a flashlight, and his phone. Everything he should need to survive the night. It would be fine, he hoped. Wasn't sure if you'd show. Oliver smirked as Mark walked up to meet him on the rickety front porch. Well, I did. I'm here. Mark fidgeted nervously, staring up at the house, its windows gazing down at him like large, dark eyes. So here are the rules. You have to stay here until sunrise. You leave before then, the deal's off. No car for you. And you have to stay alone. 
No calling for help from your little friends or your mommy and daddy. I'll be back to check on you in the morning and make sure you really did it. Got it? Got it. Mark nodded. Good luck. <laughs> I'm rooting for you. Really? Oliver turned to leave, then glanced over his shoulder for one final dig. Oh, and, uh, watch out for the ghost. I heard if she gets you, there won't even be bones left over. Night! And with that, he walked away. Mark stared down at the doorknob, preparing himself to walk inside. He could still leave. He could turn and run all the way back home. But then Oliver would be right, and he would be a coward. No, he was going to do it. He wasn't some scared little kid anymore. It was just a big, empty house, nothing more. He slowly turned the doorknob, pushed, and with a long, low creak, the door opened to the darkness within. Against his better judgment, Mark instinctively called out, Hello? There was, thankfully, no response, just his voice echoing in the vast, empty room. He let out a small sigh of relief and pulled the flashlight out of his backpack, switching it on. He cast its beam around the front room of the house, illuminating water damage, cobwebs that he could only hope were no longer housing any spiders, and a whole lot of plastic-wrapped furniture. As he walked into the living room, he was struck by just how ordinary it all seemed. It was creepy, of course, like any place made for a living that had been deprived of its purpose for far too long, but it wasn't nearly as bad as his imagination had built it up to be. He had been picturing black candles, symbols drawn on the floor in blood, a skeleton perched on the couch, bats hanging from the ceiling. But there was none of that. No ghosts, no signs of danger. This was just mostly sort of sad. Once a home, now just a house, emptied out and left to decay. He could get through the night just fine. As soon as he thought that, he felt something scurry across his foot and let out a scream. The flashlight revealed it to be a large rat running from his sudden intrusion and looking for a place to hide. He clutched his chest, catching his breath. It's just an animal. It's fine. It's not going to hurt you, he reminded himself. Now that some of the mystery was gone, he was starting to wonder what the rest of the house looked like. What had once been breathless fear was replaced with a certain morbid curiosity. If he had to be here all night, he might as well explore. Hey, he thought to himself with a smile. Exposure therapy really works. Scared of a haunted house? Just go roaming around inside the middle of the night. You'll be cured. He sat his backpack down next to the stairs, keeping a grip on his flashlight, and began to investigate the rest of his greatest childhood fear. He walked through the dining room, taking in the ornate chandelier hanging from the ceiling, the long, long table fit for housing at least a dozen guests. He wandered into the kitchen, the appliances rusty from neglect, the oven and stove where someone once prepared their nightly dinners, all the pieces of life strewn about like an unfinished jigsaw puzzle with no one to pick up the pieces. Suddenly, Mark heard something coming from the other room. It couldn't be, but it sounded like footsteps on the stairs. Someone, or something, walking down descending the staircase toward him. He held his breath, heart pounding so hard he couldn't hear it in his ears. The footsteps stopped, and the house was silent once again. Then, slowly, deliberately, he heard the same footsteps heading back up until they faded away too quiet to hear anymore. That wasn't his imagination. He was not alone in the house. Carefully, he tiptoed back the way he came, careful to not make too much noise walking across the creaking floorboards. When he reached the stairs, he saw no signs of anyone else. In fact, there was nothing there at all. Wait, where was his backpack? He scanned the floor, certain he had just overlooked it, forgetting where he sat it down. But no matter where he looked, it wasn't there. His stomach dropped with a sudden realization. Whoever he had heard coming down the stairs must have taken it. He thought briefly about abandoning it and just running out the front door and never looking back. But his phone was in there. If his parents found out, he'd be grounded for months. Not to mention, he wouldn't have a phone. But what if whoever took it was dangerous? He couldn't be sure. But something in his gut told him he needed to go upstairs and check it out. He considered the weight of the flashlight in his hand. If someone attacked him, would it be enough to defend himself? He sure hoped so. With shaky hands and unsteady legs, he began to climb the stairs to the second floor of the house. Maybe whoever had taken his backpack was just as scared of him as he was of them. It was a comforting thought, though the comfort was short-lived. As he started down the upstairs hall, preparing to search the first bedroom, he heard a door creak open behind him. He turned and froze in wide-eyed terror at the sight. 
There was a figure there, emerging from the shadows. A pale woman with long, dark hair wearing a white nightgown, reaching out to him with a clawed hand. Get out! A voice rasped. Mark shrieked, dropped the flashlight, and tore back down the stairs. He ran to the front door, but as his hand touched the doorknob, a hand grabbed his ankle and pulled. He toppled over, landing on the ground with a painful thud. Please! He sobbed, shaking from fear. Don't hurt me! I'll leave, I'll leave, I'm so sorry, don't kill me! He braced himself for an unearthly voice, for pain, but instead he heard gleeful cackling. He opened his eyes and saw Oliver standing above him. I knew you couldn't do it, you're such a chicken. He smirked. What? Mark stammered. Come on, did you really think I was going to give you my car? Are you stupid? Oliver scoffed. Clearly. Mark followed the sound of the new voice coming down the stairs. There was Chase, one of Oliver's equally awful friends. He still believes in haunted houses. Did you like my work? I made myself. He held up what Mark could now see was a prop, a mannequin dressed up like some kind of ghostly woman. He gave it a good try, but I think it's time for you to run along home now. Oliver sneered. Yeah, run home. Ugh. Chase's taunt was cut off as he fell against the banister suddenly. What the hell? Who pushed me? He whirled around, but there was no one on the stairs with him. Still, Mark could hear the sound of footsteps hammering past Chase and toward him and Oliver. What happened next shocked him to his core. Oliver was dragged to his feet by the collar of his shirt, pulled by an unseen force. Then, with a loud flack, something invisible hit him square in the nose. Ow! He cried out. But before he could react anymore, he was dealt another blow to the stomach, doubling over in pain. What the? Something swept his legs out from under him and he fell hard, head hitting the floor with a crack. Then it was quiet. Oliver was still breathing, but very much unconscious, blood trickling from his nose. Screw this! Chase yelled, bolting out the door. As Mark scrambled toward the door to follow him to run home before he could be attacked next, he saw his backpack sliding across the floor toward him. Thanks for the sandwich. A female voice said, though he couldn't see the source. I love peanut butter. Y you're welcome, he stammered before grabbing his bag and sprinting all the way home. As the story of the haunted house began to spread, rumors and local news reports alike reached the ears of the SCP Foundation. Foundation staff in the area placed infrared cameras around the abandoned house, and the footage captured a human heat signature. Whatever was in that house, it was no ghost. Using infrared cameras to track the entity, it was quickly brought into custody. Before long, the entity was opening up to the Foundation, and she offered to cooperate willingly in exchange for warm food and shelter. So, the invisible woman was taken to a nearby Foundation site and given the official classification SCP-347. SCP-347 is a young adult woman, standing at approximately 164 centimeters tall. For all intents and purposes, she is a completely average woman, with one exception, she is completely invisible to the naked eye. This includes her body, as well as everything inside of it including her blood, skin, and hair samples. Though the cones and rods of the human eye must be visible in order to see, SCP-347's vision has registered as normal following extensive tests. She refers to herself with the name Claudia, though this is assumed to be an alias inspired by Claudia Rains, the lead actor in The Invisible Man. Her real identity, if she indeed has one, has not yet been confirmed. Aside from her invisibility, SCP-347's only other notable traits are an ability to pick locks, a talent for thievery, and the ability to swallow small objects in order to turn them invisible, and then cough them up at a later time without any sickness or discomfort. She seems to crave human contact and socialization, becoming frustrated when she is ignored. She will act out in these cases by pranking people and rearranging and hiding their things. When she is left alone with someone who is sleeping, she has been known to stroke their hair, touch their face, or tuck them in. She does this, she says, because it just feels right. However, those it is done to tend to describe the behavior as unnerving. Though she is invisible in terms of visible light, she can still be seen using infrared or ultraviolet cameras. SCP-347 is currently contained at Site 1, kept in a 5 meter by 5 meter room monitored with an infrared camera. The room has an attached bathroom complete with a shower and bathtub, a queen-size bed, two armchairs, a desk and a swivel chair, several bookcases, a TV, and a DVD player. Her bookcases are filled with books, mainly adventure stories, romance novels, and art books, as per her request. 
She has also been permitted DVD copies of any movies or television shows that she asks for, as long as they predate her arrival at the SCP Foundation. New releases may be added, but only after prior approval from the research team. Though she does not frequently wear clothes, she is to be provided with any clothing that she requests, as well as a collection of makeup and wigs. She has been encouraged to dress up to her heart's content, as it allows Foundation staff to more easily gauge her location at any given time. While she is inside, the door to her room must remain locked. At least two staff members must check her door every hour for signs of tampering with the lock. The door may only be unlocked to allow staff in and out for interviews, research, and the delivery of meals and other requested items. She thoroughly enjoys human company and will chat, joke, and even flirt with those who visit her room. She is permitted to leave her containment if and only if she is accompanied by a staff member with at least level 2 security clearance, as well as wearing a layer of grease paint on her face and gloves on her hands. This allows the staff to see her hands and facial expressions. While she is out and about, staff are instructed to treat her with respect and avoid making any rude or crass comments about her invisibility, or her state of dress or undress. If she attempts to escape, she is to be returned to her room and locked inside. If the staff are unable to detect SCP-347's location, they will be given infrared heat vision goggles and instructed to keep an eye out for unusual phenomenon. Dr. Wrights added an addendum to her official file, warning male personnel to politely decline any advances that SCP-347 makes towards them. His note reads, She's an invisible kleptomaniac. When you leave afterward, you're gonna realize three seconds too late that you don't have your keys in your pocket anymore, and you will be held accountable for whatever happens. Besides, the last thing we need is an invisible pregnancy, Dr. Wrights. Yeesh. When she was first contained, SCP-347 had regular violent outbursts and displayed signs of emotional instability, including compulsive theft and depressive episodes during which she would give all surrounding people the silent treatment. Her condition has improved gradually over time, with the application of regular counseling sessions intended to help her heal from the trauma caused by years of complete isolation and being unseen by the world around her. Several of the research staff studying Claudia have suggested that she be introduced to other SCPs, particularly those who are humanoid and considered to be non-threatening. She might, they posit, benefit from social interaction with other anomalous beings that she can relate and connect to. This, in addition to her therapy, could improve her mental and emotional state significantly. After all, just because she's invisible, that doesn't mean she has to feel invisible too. Claudia has expressed a great deal of interest in this idea, stating that it would be nice to have some friends on the inside who aren't being paid to talk to her. Though no matchups have been approved as of yet, several anomalies have been proposed should the program be put into action. SCP-507 was brought up in conversation by more than one researcher, given his harmless nature, friendly demeanor, and fascination with the paranormal. He supported the idea enthusiastically, stating that he would be thrilled to meet a real-life invisible person. SCP-343 has also asked to meet with Claudia, believing he can potentially help her overcome some of her emotional difficulties and offer her some much-needed comfort. Other potential anomalies to introduce to Claudia include SCP-073 and SCP-056, though Claudia's flirtatious nature might complicate the latter. Everybody wants to be known, to be acknowledged, and recognized for the person that they know themselves to be. For SCP-347, it once seemed as if having that simple desire, that human need, met would be impossible for her. But now, for better or for worse, as long as she's in the custody of the SCP Foundation, Claudia can make something approximating a normal life. She can, at last, be seen. Now go check out SCP-811 Swamp Woman and SCP-953 Polymorphic Humanoid for even more lovely and not-so-lovely anomalous ladies.